I think that the title for this session is called Better Pipelines for Observability. And usually in every KubeCon happens something really interesting. Uh, we have Observability Day, which is our collocated event on the first day before KubeCon. And we always get a ton of feedback and we get a sense that, uh, hey, maybe the title for the talk is might need to be adjusted or the content because the type of questions that we get from the audience, attendees, and users change over time. Okay, so my name is Eduardo Silva. There you got my email. You can contact me anytime. And I would like to try to, to help you out with many things around observability in general, but specifically around logs, metrics, and traces. I have been in this space uh, for a while, I would say almost 10 years. I uh, have been part of the FluentD team. I created FluentBet uh, almost 10 years ago. Next year is 10 years. And today I'm a software engineer at Chronosphere, and I have been with the CNCF from the early beginnings. Okay, so from a landscape perspective and in sort of observability, you know that we have projects that are in, in sandbox, incubation, and graduated. FluentBet and FluentD are in graduation status together with Prometheus, Jaeger, and of course, Kubernetes. And when talking about the project, it's always good to understand why it exists and what is the vision about it. Um, Fluentbit has been designed in it from 10 years ago with the same principles that drives the roadmap today, which is let's have an agent that allows us to move data from point A to point B plus processing that is really high performance, but also with low resource usage, which is really important. And actually we didn't took this kind of mantra when we created the project at the beginning because we knew that Kubernetes was gonna be the big thing because it was just lucky that we wanted to have something for embedded Linux and this is mandatory. But somehow today we still are in that scope. Uh, also it's really important that any telemetry agent or any solution needs to be vendor neutral because in production you don't want to get to a phase where you get married with a technology and at some point you want to test it out other things and you feel blocked, right? That is the whole concept of vendor neutrality. And also it's really important that every piece of software that you deploy should be able to integrate or talk, speak to others, right? And, and that's what I'm with. And one of the main problems that we solve is like we are in a world where we have many sources of data, of information, and we need to send this information to a destination. Not because this is cool, it's because you want to do data analysis. And if you want to do data analysis, you need to collect the information, and that information comes in different sources, different formats, and this is where the problem starts. However, we have the solution for that. Fluentbit has been designed for this specific purpose, this specific, uh, to solve this specific problem. And the way that it gets deployed, it sits, it could be sitting in a very, a small embedded Linux device, right, on a virtual machine, in a container, or your bare metal server, where it can collect information from your applications over the file system, TCP, the network, and then allows you to route that information for the destination for analysis. It doesn't matter if you're using Elastic, OpenSearch, Splunk, Amazon S3, we have between sources and destination more than 100 of connectors. And sometimes you don't need to just send the data to one destination. There are many use cases where you would like to send certain type of data to one destination and other that has a different pattern or follows a different type of data to a different destination. Common use cases are, imagine uh, developer logs, which are debug messages versus security data, right? Likely those will end up on different types of scenes, different type of platforms. And your agent needs to be able to solve that. And of course, it's not just about logging. Uh, Fluentbit has evolved in the latest years to support beyond logging. Now we support logs, metrics and traces, and profiles, which is coming now. So we support all these type of signals by providing all the same high performance, low CPU, low memory usage, but providing a vendor neutral and a software that can be integrated with others like Prometheus and OpenTelemetry, which is really important nowadays. Interoperate with others allows you with being vendor neutral, allows you to scale over time. 
because the problem that you solve today when collecting data and sending data might change the next year. You will have more volume of data. You might need to have a different strategy. So you need something that can accommodate for those needs. OK, so every KubeCon, we do a really big release, right? We are releasing Fluentbit 3.2, and we're releasing observability day two days ago. And I'm going to introduce some of the changes that exist in Fluentbit. But I would like to ask first, who's using Fluentbit today? OK, awesome. So I'm sure and I hope that most of you are not using 3.2 yet. So you will learn why you should upgrade to this new version. So, well, I assume that most of you know JSON, right? We love it, we hate it, but we have to use it. It doesn't matter. And one of the biggest challenges with JSON is like all the agents, all the toolings that we have doesn't speak JSON. It can read JSON, it can write JSON, but we usually use an internal binary format. But A, Elastic, OpenSearch, Splunk, or any other, they expect to receive a JSON. And we face this where we need to convert our internal data in, from a binary format to JSON. And guess what? JSON encoding is the most expensive thing that you can find in computing uh, perspective. And why? Because encoding. For example, if you have a quotation mark, the JSON encoding says, oh, you have to add a backslash and then the quotation mark. Now it's two bytes. If you have a backslash, now you need to have backslash, backslash, right? So, and this is how the data gets encoded in ASCII and JSON or UTF-8. And it gets really expensive, right? Because in order to do this, you need to understand which character do I need to escape. So if you have a huge message, you need to iterate that message and trying to see, hey, do I need to escape this character? Do I need to escape it? And let's see an example. Imagine that you have this. How many bytes do we have in there? Guess the number. Seven. Well, seven or six is fine. This is it, right? We have a break line. So we have high, you know, a break line, and then buy. This break line is just one byte, right? It's the ASCII character for that. Now, based on JSON encoding, we need to escape that if we want to encode it as JSON. This is a very, very simple example. And now that means that that original buffer of six bytes becomes seven. And this is just two words. Imagine that you have a, lo a large text, right? It gets worse. What about this? What do you have to do if I tell you, please encode this in JSON? How long it will take? Well, if you write it in a paper, it will take some time, right? But at least we have some kind of AI in our minds that if we do, oh, I have some characters in there, I kind of know what needs to be done here. OK? And that's awesome because you have been reading JSON for years. But a computer, it's a computer. And the computer needs to go character by character trying to understand which character needs to be escaped, otherwise just copy directly or encode it increase the buffer size to be able to encode that. And we have a solution for that. And actually, since the problem we got is like, OK, this is a not fluent bit problem, but the challenge that we got every year is like users, companies tell us, hey, now we need to process 10% more of data than the year before. OK, so how do you do that? You, we need to optimize the agent. And we solve that with SIMD. Uh, are you familiar with SIMD operations? For who doesn't know, it's like SIMDs are special instructions in the CPU that allow you to run different operations, sorry, one operation in multiple bytes by using a single instruction, right? So instead, for example, of go, if I have eight bytes, instead of search for one by one by one by one, I can do one search and try and find right away if I need to escape something or not. It's really, really fast. And in the way that it works is like we can query 16 bytes at a time with a single instruction instead of doing 16 operations. 
So you may guess that if your buffer gets bigger, it gets slower, but with CMD we can optimize that. And how this works? Basically, it works like, imagine that you have this text, this is not JSON yet. What we're gonna do is the following. We are going to take the first 16 bytes, one by one, and when we're trying to see, do we have anything to escape? Yes or no? In the green bar, do we have something? The space, no, 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 we don't, no. The spatial characters are here, look. These ones. Let's, okay. So if we look for C here, for the first 16 ones, we don't have, we don't have a quotation, we don't have a backslash n, we don't have nothing. So instead, we did one operation to see, do we have to escape something here? No, what do we do? We copy the 16 bytes right away. We don't do a copy byte per byte, we just copy 16 in one block. The next one, do we have something to escape? Yes, we have a quotation mark. Okay, but CMD tells us, yes, you have to, you have something that you were looking for is here, so then we do a manual operation, one by one, because we need to know where it's located, what type it is, to understand what is the escaping needed. Okay, so we did 16 bytes, plus two, 16 operations, plus two copies, and that's fine. The next one is just one copy. There's nothing to escape. The next one, again, we found a quotation mark. Okay, then again, it's kind of a manual process, and so on until we get until the end. And at the end, we ended up with 71 operations, but without CMD, that will be 90. This is a very conservative example, right? I can write an example that's 100%, but this is kind of the normal. So you might get that we can get some optimization on CPU usage because the less operations that you do, the less CPU that you consume, and guess what? Less energy you consume. And of course, that gives you more efficiency to process more data in the future. That's one of the optimizations that we did. Also, uh, Fluentbit has known to have a very custom configuration format that is called classic mode. For who has been using Fluentbit, you know that we had the main uh, configuration file, we got parsers file, uh, we got plugins file, so different <laughs> configuration files, and in today's world, everybody's using YAML. And same as JSON, some people doesn't like it, but hey, everybody's using it, and the good thing is that if most of people are using it, most of folks wrote many tools to validate YAML, to configure or generate YAML, okay? So, Classic mode was kind of complex, different files, kind of data structures in files, kind of hard to follow. And if we got a parser in one file, you have to reference the name in the other file, which works for a small example, but if you have a huge configuration, it gets complex. So in the new YAML mode, now we have backward compatibility, and now you can define the same sections like service. Now we got the new section that is called pipelines, where you can define your inputs, your filters, your outputs, right, in the same file. And as well, this is all within the same file. You can add parsers and multi-line parsers. In addition to plugins, upstream servers, and stream processors, or SQL queries that we also support in Fluentbit. So now this will simplify when you deploy the stuff in your environment, in Kubernetes, and now you can have more flexible validations for the configuration format. And now, yes, in the same file, you can reference the same parts that is there right away. And I don't know if you're familiar, but we have this concept of processors, which are kind of filters, but this is not the scope of this talk, but maybe a quick intro. Uh, with filters, you can process, transform, enrich, or drop data. One of the biggest challenges of filters is that it used to run in the main thread, in where the main event loop exists in Fluentbit and low-level stuff. Now, since we introduced multi-threading, right, input plugins and output plugins can run in separate threads, but filters still happen in the main thread. And what happens if people start adding more filters and more filters, the main thread becomes a bottleneck, right? So with the concept of processors, and as you can see in the YAML, 
processor are like filters, but runs right after the input plugin. And if the plugin is running in a separate thread, that processing is happening in that thread and not in the main event loop. So I would encourage users to move to processors because it works really good. We were told. Okay, another interesting use case. A Fluent Bit was designed nine years ago to run on embedded Linux environments. Somehow we ended up being the default for Kubernetes and cloud native space. And somehow again, we are getting back to our roots because we got really interesting use cases. We were asked for this, to implement blob binary files. The concept is the following. We have a huge file, like a one gigabyte, but it's binary data. They are not logs, they are not traces, they are not metrics. It could be a video, a movie. And one of our users told us, hey, we need to move this to the cloud. But it cannot be handled as normal logs or normal metrics because in a, in a file, in a, video, in, a, in a movie, the order of the content matters, right? You cannot ship a video in you know, multiple parts and do not respect the, the order. It won't work. So Blob allows you to move a large file from one location with zero copy, without buffering, to, in this case, Azure Blob. So if you're using Azure Blob, you can do this. And it works for any type of data. And what was the, the way that was implemented? It's like, yeah, for logs, metrics, and traces, we do a streaming, that's fine, but Blob is different. In Blob, we implemented a new input plugin called Blob <laughs> that reads files from the file system, it discovered the files, it registered the files internally, it emit a signal into Flow Embed, and then the output plugin receives the signal, it creates logical parts of that big file. It says, I'm going to send from byte zero to byte 100, byte 100 to byte 200, and so on, and start uploading the parts to Azure Blob. And once the data, all the parts are uploaded to the system, what is that is to assemble the stuff in the right order. Then Azure Blob tells the input plugin, I'm done, and the plugin, the Blob plugin optionally can say, okay, I can delete this file. And where this come from? General Motors. General Motors is, well, I know you're familiar with the brand, right? They make cars, right? And they are, have a cool new fleet of cars, that those cars are really smart, and they are running different operating systems like QNX, Linux, and Android. Yeah, you, you will, is what? Yes, it is. And Fluentbit is running on these cars now. And Fluentbit is collecting the telemetry and also uploading these big blob files, which most of the time are videos that the card is recording for surveillance, for security purposes, to the cloud for the customers. So if you get a new GM card at the end of this year, you will be running Fluentbit, likely. Of course, the new models, right? <laughs> okay. And another question that he got this week a lot was open telemetry, open telemetry. And so we wanted to take some time to talk about our vision with open telemetry and how the Fluent ecosystem correlates with Hotel. Because I'm sure that most of you are using or want to use Hotel. Oh, please raise your hand if you're thinking about Hotel already. There you go, so this is slideshow for you. Okay, so. Let's start from the beginning. Open Telemetry provides an open source standard for logs, metrics, and traces, right? We know this as a standard, it means like a unique way to define data. And the way that it does it, it creates, or not creates, specify a schemas for logs saying, logs will follow these schemas, metrics these schemas, and traces this other schema. So anybody who wants to be compliant need to be able to write on these schemas or read from those schemas. Perfect. Now, generating data on these schemas is not enough. The second step in hotel is to move this information through a transport. That's what we call OTLP, the Open Telemetry Protocol. Okay, so if you have a tool that speaks OTLP, you can receive this telemetry data. It's really simple, really good concept. And of course, the next step is like, okay, I have the schema, I have the transport, but where this data comes from? And this is where instrumentation comes in. Hotel encourages users to instrument their applications by using the open telemetry SDKs 
for Golang, Python, Rust, all the languages that are available. So your application can natively create telemetry data, package that with that schema, and use a transport of OTLP to send that to an OTLP endpoint. This is purely open telemetry. And this is where Fluembit sits in. Fluembit fully implements all the schemas of open telemetry, and Fluembit speaks today full OTLP. That means that Fluembit is complying with open telemetry story. Now, if you ask, okay, isn't this like the open telemetry collector? Yes, the open telemetry collector is an implementation of open telemetry, OTLP plus schemas. Same as Fluembit. So now you have two choices, Fluembit, OTL collector. But it's up to the user to decide which one to use depending on the use case. So applications instrumented with open telemetry can speak directly to Fluembit and Fluembit can send that information out to any type of endpoint. It could be OTLP or it could be anything else, Amazon S3. It doesn't matter. We can do OTL from the input, OTL from the output because we speak OTLP. For us, OTLP is just one more protocol. Same as we support Prometheus Remote Write, we support Syslog, we support OTLP. And also, Fluembit can be used like a way to route, receive data from multiple endpoints. Another feature that we found is like, if you are in an ideal open telemetry world, your application ships data by using these schemas, by using OTLP. That is perfect. But if you go to reality, most of your applications are not instrumented with OTLP, with open telemetry. So in Fluembit, we have a way to package any type of data that is not open telemetry native, right, as open telemetry. And we call that a processor that is called open telemetry envelope that applies for logs. But also with the version 3.2, we ship the new open telemetry envelope for metrics. So imagine that you're receiving metrics over stats Z, over a UDP port, <laughs> right? You can convert that to open telemetry without any problem. And once you convert the data to hotel, you can uh, add all the attributes, you can play with resources, with the scope, everything that you might need in that world. Processors, as I mentioned, are a way to process the data. That means enrich, transform, discard, or whatever you want for logs, metrics, and traces. And we got a couple of them. And I will try to go to the latest slides and then jump into the demo and the hands-on demo. Okay, we're talking about processors and the new experimental features. This is really, I, I know that everybody loves benchmarks. But disclaimer, before looking at the next slides, I will encourage every single user to always run your own benchmarks because I could be lying, others could be lying, and at the end of the day, when you are talking about performance, every use case is different, every, every workload is different. So run your own tooling with your own numbers and take your best decision. What I'm going to show here is what we found in our case. Very simple benchmark, reading a huge file, parsing the lines as JSON, and just dropping the content. So on that way, we can see how we can read the data, uh, package that data internally and just drop it. We are not doing network I.O. We are not using SIMD on this. This is just raw basic uh, processing. We tested out different um, agents. Vector, which is a data doc agent today. The open telemetry collector, FluentD and FluentBet. We got different uh, numbers here. What really impo is important is the median here. The median means like Okay, so how far did this is, you know, kind of working? It's not the average because the average always can be very different. But also the standard deviation will tell you how much is the fluctuation in between the samples, right? So somehow Fluentbit was able, by the base default setup was able to beat the others in CPU usage for this test. And this is how it looks on the chart. On the left, we have the chart for the median, then the 90 percentile, 95, and the standard deviation. Now, when processing data, CPU is important, but also we need to care about how much memory we have or we're using. And for the same test, you can guess that full and bit was almost using 25 megabytes, 27, sorry, 
while others were 98, almost 200, 300 megabytes. Now, this is not that much if you have one instance, but if you are in a real production environment running hundreds of agents, this matters. And if you are running in the cloud, uh, sometimes you end up paying by CPU usage, right? So sometimes you have to take a, a smart decision on which one you will use based on your own use cases. But these are our benchmarks. Please uh, run yours. Now we are chipping two experimental features, and one is eVPF. I'm sure that you may, might be familiar with eVPF, might not. Um, I would suggest for everybody to watch on YouTube, there's a documentary from the CNCF, I think from this, or oh, Isovalent, that they take, talks about eVPF, why it exists, what's the value for the market, and how that is kind of a revolution on how we operate in systems today. But the good thing about eVPF is like, it allows you to monitor the kernel activities at different level, like processes, the file access, uh, the type of memory allocations that have been done by the processes, uh, the network connections or signals, right? So this is really important for security purposes, but also if you want to uh, monitor or inspect what a specific application is using so much CPU, hey, you might use eVPF to understand what system call is calling, what is, the, what is the latency, or what it's doing. So with version 3.2, we just shipped the first uh, eVPF plugin, which is experimental, but it works. And we say experimental because this thing, type of implementation takes time to, to measure. So we expect that maybe in a couple of weeks, couple of months, this will get more um, mainstream and stable. And the other one is like we implemented profiles or profiling. In the open telemetry world, right, it, they, we have the concept of signals, which are the type of events, right? Logs, metros, and traces. Now, profiles is something that has existed for many, many years in the market. Maybe you have used Payproof, or you have run Perf in Linux to, to see what's going on inside each application. But when in this world of distributed environments, you will like sometimes to do profiling on applications, and we got the same problem. Okay, we generate the profiles, how do we package the profile, how we send the profiles over the network, how do we aggregate them to do analysis, right? It's the same thing that Fluembet and Hotel Collector are doing. So OpenTelemetry folks are coming with a new specification, a new schema for profiles based on payproof, which kind of the the classic formats, as here you can see what is the link of this schema, it's just in development phase. However, in Fluembit, we're, we're experimenting with this already. So we are able to receive uh, profiles over OTLP and process those profiles. And the way to test it is like, I don't know if you noticed, but Elastic, the Elastic company, donated to OpenTelemetry what we call an eVPF profiler, which is a tool that runs on the Linux system, generate profiles, and speaks OTLP with these profiles to a collector of Fluembit. And we have implemented that. So I think I have just a, a few minutes. So I would like to show you step by step um, some things about uh, Fluembit. Or maybe with visual code, I think it's better. Okay, so regarding processors, I'm going to speak what we have here. We have a pipeline, this is a definition in YAML. I hope that you can see it on the screen and it's readable. Please, no, uh, awesome. So we're using the dummy input plugin, we just generate the same message over and over, right? And we're going to send this to the standard output. So, should Flumbe should be my environment? I think it should be like that. Yeah, it's running. And now it's just shipping that message, you know, in the output. Actually, let me do something we can do. It's in format JSON, we can do JQ. So you can see how the data is changing or, or the format that it has. Okay, so this is just to test the ingestion. And now we're going to start adding a processor. Imagine that you want to add a one key. You just append the processor, right? Right after the input. And we have processor for logs, metrics, and traces. So you will define that this processor will only apply for the signal type of logs emitted by that input plugin. It's called content modifier, 
And content modifier has different action to insert, absurd, delete, or hash. I'm going to show some of them right now. We're going to add a new key that's called new key or value, for example, kubecon. I'm going to save that, write it again. And you will see now how this um, new key uh, it exists at the end that is called kubecon. This is a very basic example, right? And same as we have something really simple, at some point you will say, oh, you know what? I would like to process this address, I split this address. And we have other processor which is um, a bit more elaborated, which is the same one, but it changes the action. It's called extract. And extract what it does based on a pattern, a regular expression, you can tell how to split the content of that line in multiple keys. Of course, these regular expressions, you can use some, any type of tool like Rubular or OpenAI, ChatGPT, to generate these rules to make your life easier. And if we start writing that, you will notice now that we, got, we have created four new keys based on the content of a previous key that existed before. Now, when this is useful, it is useful to, to remove data, to obfuscate data for security purposes, or just to do analysis. Not all the data that you had not all that data you need. Sometimes you need to drop it. And as you can see, every processing unit can be run from top to bottom. So the output of the first one is the input of the next one. And you can have a chain of processing rules. And it will work really, really fast. Okay, that is processors. And maybe we can go with uh, profiling. So what I have here is the eVPF profiler. This one is from OpenTelemetry, but as I said, from Elastic. Let me see what I have here. And this is my configuration for Fluembed for profiles. This is what I'm running, an OpenTelemetry input endpoint in my Fluembed. And now I'm going to send the output of that to STDout. Oops, there's no fluent bit here. There we go. And now we're going to run the profiler. And the profiler will start sending the data to fluent bit every couple of seconds. I'm going to stop it here. Okay, there we go, the profiles. Let me stop it so you can read it. So what you have here is a text representation of the profiles being generated by eVPF profiler on the left. Yeah, the message is really noisy, but of course, you are going to use this in a different way with proper tools for analysis and visualization. So the future of Fluent Bit belongs in a way that will solve majority of use cases for telemetry data associated with logs, metrics, traces, and profiling. And if we have one more minute, maybe we can show really quickly eVPF, the eVPF plugin. This one is, let me check. Okay, this is just the eVPF plugin that we're going to hook to the trace signals, malloc allocations, and bind. This is really, really simple, very experimental. Oops, I need sudo. Let me see if I have permissions for that. Uh-oh, no, it doesn't allow me. This is what happens when you connect to your machine in Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, I'm using Tailskit to connect to that remote endpoint. But so I think I have some wireless issue. Oh. Uh, okay, but well, EVPF me can show you later. Uh, we will have this recorded. So uh, next week, we have a webinar, which I just show you on the slides, that you can sign up. It was, I think, the first slide. So if you join the newsletter, you will get the invite, and you will be able to see all this content. Now, for everybody who has questions, I think we are going to run out of time. So first of all, we have a special gift for you. We have t-shirts, hats, and Fluent Bit books in the back. And I will be there in case you have questions.